Welcome, 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 welcome again to another edition of Inspirational Wednesdays. Today is Wednesday, January 8th, 2014. That's right, y'all. That's right. We are in a new year that even though God made sure that 2013 became history, he made sure that we stayed current, that we are alive and in living color in 2014, and we are here to worship God through prayer, praise, and devotion. It's our prayer. It's our uh, deepest desire uh, that God would use this time, use us to be able to lift the prayer concerns, the the the, the worries, the 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 requests that you have for God, no matter how big, no matter how small, that would enable you to believe enough by faith, so that when God sends you someplace or positions you, you would be able to stand by faith and be the disciple and the steward that He's calling you to be. Amen. Amen. And it is again our pleasure to be here. Happy New Year's to you. We trust and pray that you've had a safe, wonderful, wonderful, happy holiday season that you understood and God let you experience exactly why uh, we have Christmas. It's not to give gifts, but to experience and share the love of family and friends and that you had a wonderful celebration with the birth of a new year and the conclusion of a, of a past year. Amen. Amen. Let us not tarry. Let us get right into it. We're going to have our opening morning prayer, and then we're going to jump right into our devotional. All right, so let us go to God in prayer. Dear Father God, creator of the heavens and the earth, we come to you right now thanking you, God, for just being an awesome God, just being a wonderful God, just being a God of consistency, dependability, and love. You have done so much for us that if you never do anything else, you're worthy of all the praise. Now, God, we ask that you'll be merciful to us, that you will bless us with your Holy Spirit as we spend the next 50 minutes or so coming to you, petitioning you, calling upon you, pulling upon your grace and mercy, asking for your intercession and your intervention into our lives in whatever form or way that we need, so that God, when it's said and done, you are glorified and we are edified and able to become and be and serve you as a disciples and student, stewards that you called us to be. It's in your son's mighty match, whose marvelous and magnificent name that we do pray. Amen. Amen, everyone. Amen. The scriptorial focus for our devotional this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew, the 6th chapter, the 25th through 34th verses. That's Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 34. I'll, I will read from the New Revised Standard Version of the Scripture. The Word of God is as follows. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or what you will drink or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your span of life? And why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and thrown, tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, What will we eat? Or what will we drink? Or what will we wear? For it is the Gentiles who strive for all these things. And indeed your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be given to you as well. So do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will bring worries of his own. Today's troubles, trouble is enough for today. Thus far, the Word of God. The title of this morning's devotional is 
Destroying Fear's Dominion Over Us, Part 1. Destroying Fear's Dominion Over Us, Part 1. We Christians live in a world based in fear. Every time we turn around, someone or something is reminding us of just how much we have to be afraid of. Every hour on the hour, our televisions air advertisements from different security companies informing us that we need the safety their security service provide, services provide. We're repeatedly told that the only way we can be absolutely certain that we will be safe and secure from other far more dangerous persons is if we bring these companies and their products into our personal lives. And to really scare us into purchasing these services, these security companies run the same basic commercial over and over again. We're constantly shown a white woman at home with very, very young children when all of a sudden some thuggish and nefarious looking derelict terrorizes this woman and those children by kicking in some glass door or other entryway. These securities companies hope that our fear will immediately kick in and personalize to our own lives the images we see on the television. Once personalized, they further hope that our fear will then manipulate us into contacting them and demanding that they immediately provide us with every security product that they have. Only then will we feel that our loved ones and ourselves are safe from the dangers our fears have forced upon us. But that's not the only way fear controls our society. If we pay close attention to politicians running for public office, 9.99 times out of 10, they play on our fears. Their hope is to scare us into believing that if their opponent wins this election, our ways of life will denigrate into disorder and chaos. The only way to prevent this from happening is by casting our votes for the political candidates that scare us the least, mainly them. We could go on and on about the ways fear repeatedly reminds us about how dangerous this world is. From identity theft, to choosing the right sitter for our children, to having the right car insurance, fear is the operative word in our world. And as all-encompassing as fear is, this really isn't anything new to us Christians. Fear was just as live and in living color during Jesus' day as it is currently. The Jews lived in a world that was very antagonistic towards them. As one of the few ethnicities that worship one God and one God only, other ethnicities looked upon the Hebrews with suspicion. Because they weren't polytheistic, as the rest of the Roman world, the children of Israel were feared. Now we're aware that it's human nature to fear what we don't understand. And this fear caused Romans to view the Hebrews as a strange and peculiar people that needed to be harshly regulated. Therefore, the Jews were outcasts in a Roman world. They were frequently ostracized and physically harassed. Unfortunately, this meant that they lived in fear of basically everyone and everything. Knowing this, God felt the need to address fear's dominion over his people. And he began by tackling the issue of worry. Many of us may not readily recognize the connection between worrying and fear, but God wants each of us to walk away today knowing beyond a shadow of a doubt that these two things are intimately connected. Worrying is a primary way for fear to exercise control over a Christian's life. Jesus instructs his disciples not to worry. He commands us not to fret about our individual lives or how our daily needs will be met. For most of us, this is an extremely tall order. We've got so much going on that if we don't vigilantly monitor the 10,000 different moving parts of our lives, they will fly apart at the seams. 
Worrying about our lives and how our needs will be met isn't an option for many of us. Rather, it's the standard. Yet here is Jesus ordering us not to worry. Now let's get this out in the open from the start. Our Lord and Savior never instructs us not to be concerned about our needs, obligations, and responsibilities. He never permits us to abandon our common sense. The key to being effective disciples and stewards is managing our time, abilities, and resources in such a way that our personal responsibilities don't conflict with our spiritual obligations. What Jesus is speaking about here is excessive worrying. It's the constant fretting that many of us engage in for no other reason than to fret. It's being anxious that in the next second, minute, hour, day, or week, something will cause our house of cards to topple over. And many times, the key piece that we're most afraid will cause everything to collapse in on us is someone or something that falls within our innermost and most sacred classification of necessities. Whoever that is, whatever that is, Jesus compels us to stop spending valuable energy worrying about him, her, or it. Instead, Jesus challenges us to understand life as God understands it. He wants us to see life and all of its essence as something more than simply necessities to obsess over. Worry begets anxiety. Both of them empower fear within our minds and souls. And when this happens, we can only see life through the lenses of scarcity. We believe that there is a certain finite number of whatever it is we need, regardless of, what, of whether that need is time, resources, help, or opportunity. If we don't take what we need now, then whatever that need is won't be here tomorrow. Want to know how powerful fear is? It's so powerful and so mind-consuming that it makes us forget verse 10 of Psalm 50. We forget that the cows on a thousand hills belong to the Lord. And when we hear hills in this context, we should visualize mountains as large as Mount Kilimanjaro and Mount Fiji. The image that the psalmist creates is one where the Lord represents overabundancy. It's an image of infinity. It's an image where the number of resources available to us is so large that our minds can't honestly wrap themselves around it. The psalmist wants us to realize that as God's people, there's never a reason to worry about how our needs will be met. The Lord has more than enough of whatever we need at any given moment of our lives. But Jesus takes this point the psalmist makes a step further. He shares with us how our Heavenly Father cares for the needs of other life forms here on earth. He ensures that both plants and animals have everything they need in order to survive. They're fed and nourished daily. They're constantly clothed and protected from nature's elements. And as much as the Lord does for them, Jesus declares that God doesn't love any plant or animal more than he loves us. Therefore, if our Heavenly Father does all of this for things he loves less than us, there really isn't any limit to what he will do for us in terms of meeting our needs. Literally, the sky is the limit for God's chosen people. This means we no longer have to worry about making sure we have all the necessities of life. That God's got that cover because that's God's responsibility. Our responsibility, on the other hand, is establishing and maintaining God's kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven and demonstrating his righteousness to others. That's our responsibility. And Jesus promises us that if we will be faithful at doing this, everything we need, God will provide. No need will be left unmet, no necessity left unresolved and unhandled. So, the first step in destroying fear's dominion over us 
is for us to stop worrying. Stop allowing ourselves to be consumed with all the possible ways we can fail or otherwise experience demise. Rather, we must focus the energy that we've used in the past to fret, obsess, and be obnoxious about things that only the Lord can handle. We must become the disciples and stewards that God has called us to be. It's a new year. And our Heavenly Father is expecting us to accomplish the impossible to the glory of His name. Amen. Let us have a word of prayer. Dear Father, God, creator of the heavens and the earth, there's no way around it. We've allowed fear to control our worship. Instead of being the instruments of faith that you've called us to be, we've cowered in the shadows using excuse after excuse as why we can't serve you as disciples and stewards. We've been so scared and afraid for so long that we miss how fear has gained dominion over us. Fretting, doubting, being anxious, and otherwise worrying has provided fear with the doorway to enter into our lives and contaminate us from the inside out. But starting today, we're going to fight our fears. We're going to push back through faith. We're going to stop obsessing about things that are clearly within your purview, God. Only you can ensure that the sun rises in the morning. So, we're turning that worry over to you. Only you can soften hearts and renew broken relationships. So, we're turning that worry over to you. Only you can open doors that are otherwise closed to us. So, we're turning that worry over to you. Only you can make a way out of no way at all. So, we're turning that worry over to you. No more will fear have the final say-so over what we think or believe. We declare by faith that fear is no longer welcomed in our lives. And in so declaring, we commit to exercising faith in new ways every time we're confronted with a scary situation or a frightful event. It's in your son's matchless, marvelous, mighty, and magnificent name that we do pray. Amen. Amen, everyone. Amen. We just had our morning devotional, and it's our prayer that God was able to speak to you in some mighty way about worrying and how worrying really opens the door for fear to come into our lives and really gain a foothold in our lives that's very hard for us to shake. You know something while we were going through that devotional and something when uh, God was working with me over the last few days and prepping for this uh, call this morning, he said that many things uh, that we experience in life, health-related, like migraines, uh, physical health issues, sicknesses, illnesses, many of them are stress-related. And you know how stress uh, develops in our life? By worrying. Worrying about things nine times out of ten that are beyond our ability to handle, beyond our ability to control, beyond our ability, period. And God said that if we would stop worrying, then many of the things we are dealing with health-wise will disappear. That he said, some things that we're worrying about, he's already worked them out in the grand scheme of things, in his plan for our lives. It's going to work. You ain't got to worry if you're going to be here tomorrow. You ain't got to worry if ultimately you're going to succeed. You ain't got to worry if ultimately you will you ever be loved. You ain't got to worry if ultimately will you ever get the job that you're really looking for. You ain't got to worry about ultimately will you be elevated into the position that God has promised you you'll be elevated. God said he's already worked that out. He said, why are you spending time now worrying about the process. You're worrying about the steps of getting there. You're worrying about how much time it's going to take to for something to develop. God said, why are you worried about that? He said, that's not your, your, your responsibility. Your responsibility is use the time I've given you now in this place to glorify me to the best of your ability so that when I move you from this place to the next place, this place is left looking more like me am operating more according to my will than it was before you ever got here. So, if we want to operate in faith and we want to 
reduce fears, control, and manipulation of us, then do this. Stop worrying. Stop worrying. Don't obsess over anything. Don't stress over anything. If it's something beyond your ability, bring it to the altar. Leave it at God's feet. Go back to your life and do the best you can at being the best disciple and the best steward God has called you to be. Amen? Amen. It is now time for us to jump in and to get uh, started on the our prayer section of the, call, of the call. This is the part I like about the call because this is the part where we get to share with one another what it is that we want one another to stand in agreement and in prayer for us. Now, let me say this to all of us, especially those persons who are new to our call this morning. You don't need a prayer group in order to pray. Prayer is not one of those things that is conditioned on the number of people participating with you. What a prayer group does for you, the prayer group gives you the strength of numbers and, this, and the access of additional faith for you to articulate the prayer concern, get it to God, and be able to walk away from the altar knowing that whatever it is you prayed about in the midst of the group, God was was faithful and definite to hear. This is where the word comes in, where it says, where two or more gathered, there shall also be. Jesus was telling his disciples that. Well, that's what happens. With us being together, you are guaranteed that God is in our midst. You're guaranteed that he's listening. You're guaranteed that he's taking notice of whatever it is that is on your heart and mind. And so what we want you to do, we want you to, again, in fact, this is a good practice, a good practice, a good application of what we just talked about in, in our devotional. We want you to put fear to the side for a moment. Put worry to the side. Don't worry about who's on the call with you. Don't stress about what someone will think if you would, when you raise your prayer concern. Don't obsess with whether or not someone's going to judge you. Because the truth is, we all have issues that we need God to address. We all have problems that we're, that we're dealing with that we need God's help on. We don't have time to judge you. So let's put our fear to the side and let's step boldly out in faith to articulate our prayer concerns so that God may begin moving in our lives in a very powerful way. And let me also say this, uh, God moving in your life isn't conditional on any one of us. God's moving on your, in your life is conditioned upon the faith you demonstrate. And here it is, we're here to stand with you by faith so that God is impressed that God is, 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 is instigated, God is encouraged to do what it is he needs to do to bring you through whatever it is you're going through so that when you come out on the other side, you have a testimony that changes lives when other persons hear it. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to open up the floor for prayer. We want you to share with us who you are, where you're calling from, and we'll go from there. If you are afraid that uh, someone may recognize you, uh, recognize who you are, and may judge you, if fear still has a has a, a stronghold over you, then just tell us where you're calling from, and we'll go from there. But the most important thing is, do not sit on your prayer. All right. Remember, you may have the prayer that I have, but I don't know how to articulate. And so you raising your prayer may do more than just bless you. It may end up blessing me because guess what? And when God shoots two for one in, 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 in receiving your prayer today. So with that said, let's not tear it. Let's jump right into it. If you have a praise report, a prayer concern, or a prayer that you want us to uh, pray with you and for you about, please give us your name and where you're calling from, and that we'll go from there.